Let's talk about these, what I call, I, I think it's most properly called experimental biological agents. You might hear me use that phrase. Definitely you should not be calling this the COVID-19 vaccines. The reason is, whatever you call it, it's experimental. It's not been approved as a vaccine. It's currently in its investigational stage. It's been approved by, uh, the, I've, I'm, I don't want to misspeak which, uh, the FDA I assume is the one who would approve it, but it's in an investigational stage only. AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. That's very important legally. If you were to be injured by something and it's an experimental stage, it's adjudicated under a particular standard. So what, what, is, what are the potential problems with this experimental biological agent? The first most obvious is that this is brand new technology. The first two that are coming to market use something called mRNA technology, which has never ever been used before for vaccines. This is when, when you hear a, a lot of the more kind of concerning and flamboyant issues, it's because people are very worried that this is brand new mRNA technology. I don't really go down that path, but what I can say is I don't really want to be the first person to take brand new things when it comes to medicine, right? You don't have to be a genius to say that. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is there's been a tremendous failure of previous coronavirus vaccines. This is not well known, but there are multiple coronavirus viruses out there. For example, in 2002, there was an epidemic, a much smaller one, but an epidemic of SARS-CoV-1. What we're in right now is SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, by the way, you may have heard it called the novel coronavirus, are what we're in right now. I never understood that because this coronavirus is 78% identical to SARS-CoV-1. That's in fact, that's why it has the name SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> They're 78% the same. So prior coronavirus um, vaccine attempts have been made. They have failed. They can't do it safely in human beings. And I'm gonna talk more about that later. But just note that we've not been able to successfully overcome the, the human bodily hurdles that making a vaccine against a coronavirus has put up. Number three, there is no independently published animal studies. One of the companies d says they do have animal studies, but they haven't published any data on it. There's been a complete rush to put this to market, and you simply cannot do this safely without published data on animal studies, because animals often will die at the end, and unless we know that, we don't know if it's safe to give to humans. Okay, problem number four is known complications. One of the most commonly known complications of vaccines is something called, big science words coming up guys, antibody dependent enhancement. It's also sometimes called immune enhancement and it's sometimes called pathogenic priming. What this is, is instead of really causing immunity, it causes a person to overreact in a negative way if they should ultimately be exposed to the virus. This thing called antibody-dependent enhancement or pathogenic priming, although you haven't heard of it, is well known to scientists. I like to say it has its own Wikipedia page. This is not fringe. This exists and this is real. The biggest problem with antibody-dependent enhancement, we see this with prior coronavirus vaccines. So when they were doing the studies with SARS-CoV-1 vaccine, back in 2005, they came up with a vaccine and they gave it to the ferrets and it was two dosed like the ones today and the ferrets did fine after the first dose, they did fine after the second dose. Later they exposed them to the coronavirus SARS-CoV-1 in the wild and the ferrets died. That's why SARS-CoV-1 vaccine never came to market. Antibody dependent enhancement. You can find all the information I'm discussing on americasfrontlinedoctors.com, vaccine information. Also, I'll get to it at the end at the stopmedicaldiscrimination.org site. It has it there as well. Everything is well footnoted and referenced. So known complications include antibody-dependent enhancement and also some of the things you've seen in the news, like neurologic problems, like transverse myelitis, Bell's palsy, Guillain-Barre, et cetera. Those are known complications with vaccines that already exist. There's also a lot of issues with unknown vaccinations. I think what's going wrong on the other side is a, is, is a complete lack of respect for what you don't know. We don't know what we don't know until you discover it. I mean, these are the things parents teach their children. They don't know enough, right? 
So what are the potential unknowns? Well, something that I learned this year, actually in the last few months, which I was shocked because I never saw this anywhere in the newspaper, and I'd like a show of hands from anybody here who's heard of this before my mentioning it. Has anybody here heard of potential fertility problems with this vaccine? That's amazing, you guys. Congra I, I did not know this myself until about maybe two months ago. So I had to look into it. And by the way, the America's Frontline Doctors put together 10 doctors working for more than a month to put together all this research. So there's a question if this vaccine, a biological agent, I should say, affects this thing called the syncytiotrophoblast, which is a layer on the placenta. Now, it does seem to do that when you're sick with COVID-19. The problem is that these mRNA vaccines kind of mimic having COVID-19 indefinitely. So while COVID-19 could be bad for the placenta and the baby, if you get it like in the middle of the pregnancy, eventually COVID-19 goes away and you go about your life and then you're good. There's a question if this type of experimental agent does that same negative effect to the syncytiotrophoblast layer of the placenta and it would do it indefinitely. This is not a conspiracy. As a scientist, I'm telling you, we don't know. We don't know. Scientists better than me, right? There's the two guys in Europe that were ex-Pfizer executives that complained about this and filed a petition with the European equivalent of the FDA saying you've got to not approve this as an emergency experimental vaccine because we haven't answered the question on the antibody-dependent enhancement and we haven't answered the question on the placenta. It hasn't been answered, that it's dangerous to release this. And you have to put that together with what is the risk of even having this problem. Certainly in younger women, right? Women under 50, the survival, we said, per the CDC, is 99.98%. For that reason, America's Frontline Doctors feels very strongly that you cannot even offer this to women of childbearing age. So, and we'll get to our official recommendations at the end. But I put, we put that information under the category of what we don't know. We simply don't know. We don't know what the effect is permanently on the placenta. Another fact that is very concerning is that pharmaceuticals who manufacture these experimental biological agents are immune from all liability. So you probably, this group probably knows that, but I'm not saying that they have a negative motive. I think mostly they have a profit motive. I'm not saying they're trying to hurt people or kill people. What I am saying is that if you know that you could be sued and pay out millions of dollars every single time something goes wrong, you're really, really careful, okay? You're a little less careful if you know you're gonna be shielded from that liability, and they're completely shielded. So when people ask me, you know, am I gonna take the vaccine? Would I recommend my children take the vaccine? I said, it's, it's really irrational to take a brand new, untested, untried technology from a company that's completely shielded from immunity. When on the other hand, I've got a drug that's 65 years old, has been given billions of time, completely safe for all age groups, right? Now, those are the safety concerns with this experimental biological agent. What are the concerns regarding the effectiveness? Now, what's super shocking is that there's no proof that this biological agent actually stops the transmission amongst people. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like a joke, right? This is like a joke. It's like the punchline to a joke. Let's take a vaccine, and by the way, it doesn't actually stop transmission. I mean, <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that. Like, I, I discovered that quite recently, and I, I just, I couldn't believe it. And that's, by the way, that's not in dispute now that I'm telling you that. The Surgeon General gave an interview uh, 20 days ago, last two, two weeks and six days ago on a Monday, to Good Morning America, stating that. And it's been well documented now. It does not, it is not known if it stops transmission. Um, I think what's going to happen, <sighs> You know, it's kind of putting people into sort of an asymptomatic carrier kind of state. In other words, people are turning positive. You might have started to see some news stories now, people taking the vaccine, and now they're testing positive for COVID-19. It's kind of funny, like, we don't, are they gonna test positive forever? Like, what does that mean? You know, they've been selling us this bill of goods that there's this asymptomatic transmission, and that seems to be moot. But if you're gonna have, you know, tens or hundreds of millions running around, just kind of positive, low level, like, what does that mean? Like, why are we doing that? Another problem with doing that is I think they're gonna game the numbers, right? All these people, let's say you give this vaccine to 100 million people and now all 100 million people are quote unquote testing positive for COVID-19. They're gonna tell us that the cases have risen and you know, we can never relax. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, it's unbelievable. 
Um, there's been no proof that this is actually reducing mortality. Certainly from the levels of non-lethality that we're seeing, it would be hard to demonstrate that there's any real advantage, right? The, the odds of dying from this illness are already incredibly low. The third question about its effectiveness, we simply don't know, even if it was effective and not dangerous, we don't know how long it lasts. In other words, are you going to be asked to take this vaccine once in a lifetime, or are you going to be asked to take this vaccine yearly like influenza? We don't know. Those questions are not answered. So, I want to also, I, I keep referencing the fact that we need to call this by its proper name. Never talk about this without the word experimental. That's critical. One of the problems that we doctors are concerned about, about this antibody-dependent enhancement potential, which we, again, I'm not saying it exists or it doesn't exist, I'm saying it hasn't been answered, is if you're going to run around and give this vaccine to a whole bunch of healthy people, you have to be really, really sure. Taking a vaccine is very different than taking a drug for a disease. If you have a disease, you're certainly willing to take on more risk, right, to get rid of the disease. But vaccines are typically given to healthy people. Now, what's going to happen if you give this vaccine to 100 million people that are otherwise healthy, and they do have this antibody-dependent enhancement reaction because we haven't ruled it out, they do get exposed to the virus in the wild, and 30% of them drop. And what if, for example, you've given that vaccine to all of your healthcare workers, and you've given that vaccine to all of your military and all of your police officers? I find this shocking as a public policy matter that we would even consider giving, these, giving anything to our healthy first responders and, and frontline people who defend our country. I, I, it, it's, it's, it's so shocking in its, in its risk. It, it, I, 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 you see me, I'm struggling for the words. It's so shocking to accept that kind of risk. And again, I want to be not misquoted. I'm not saying this is definitely going to happen, but I'm saying based on prior SARS, prior SARS COVID vaccine, prior SARS coronavirus vaccines, there is a definite concern for antibody-dependent enhancement. This particular virus has very low lethality. Should you give it to healthy people? Not knowing the answer to that question is far too risky, in my opinion, from a national security perspective.